I welcome you this morning as we gather together in God's presence to worship him, uh, to give thanks for all of his goodness and his grace for us, uh, and to bring our praises to him. Well, as we gather in his presence, uh, I welcome those of you who worship with us regularly, but also those of you who may be visiting. Uh, we're glad that you're here this morning. As we got, gather in God's presence, it's God who calls us with words from Romans chapter 5. Will we stand as we listen to these words together? The Apostle Paul says that since we are justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have obtained access to this grace in which we stand, and we boast in the hope of sharing the glory of God. And not only that, but we also boast in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope. And hope does not disappoint us, because God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit that God has given us. Well, in the shadow of God's peace, in the powerful name of Jesus, and with the hope of the Holy Spirit, we worship God, and he greets us with these words, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ through the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Well, let's continue our time of worship as we remain standing and sing together, How Great is Our God. seated. Well, God is great, and his greatest gift of all is the gift of his grace for us. And let's again turn to him uh, in a time of confession, but also a time of being renewed in his grace. Well, triune God, we praise you as the God of love and life. Though Jesus prayed that we would be one, we confess that we fail to live in unity with each other and with you. We break our communion through hostile words and unkind actions. We long for your spirit to heal us and to correct us. 
We long for you to help us experience communion with you and with each other as we gather around your word. And even now, dependent on your grace, we commit ourselves to live more fully in the unity that you desire. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Let's sing a song of forgiveness and grace. To the hills I lift my eyes. This time, boys and girls, I invite you to come and join me up at the front. You can sit in the front row if you like. You can sit on the steps, whatever you would enjoy the most. You can sit on the ground. Okay. Good to see you. Okay, so there's one quick instruction I need. You girls who are sitting here, are you able to just push back? I need to leave a little bit of space here. Oh, sorry, can you push back towards the chairs? Yeah, thanks. I need to leave a space right here. Oh, so Emma and Carly are going to help me with something. If you come over here for a second, um, can you go stand by the banner with Joseph on it? All right, now Carly, your job's easy. You just stay there for now. All right, now Emma, can you walk to me? Excellent job. Okay, you can go back. All right, now we're going to try something. This is going to be fun. All right, come this way for a sec. Oh, don't worry, no, this is going to be okay. I brought this tea towel from home. She's going to get kidnapped. Well, I don't know about that. Got one of those white vans in the... Now, can you see anything? No. All right. Now, your sister is going to help you. Because uh, she's going to make sure. Now, she's going to come beside you. Now, I want you to walk back to that same spot that you were. Go for it. Go. No, no, you, yeah, you go for it. You walk over there. Okay. Yep, keep going. Are you there yet? I don't know. Okay, all right. Good enough, good enough, good. You're fine. Thank you. You can pull that off. And Anyway, I just... I wasn't hoping you'd fall or anything, but was it harder to walk when you couldn't see anything? Yeah. So this morning we're going we're gonna to hear about the Apostle Paul. He's first known as Saul. Thanks for help. You were, your job was to make sure she didn't you know, run into a wall, so you did a good job. Um, you know, he's got kind of, when he, when he first kind of starts out, he's got a lot of anger in his heart, and he's trying to hurt all the Christians and everything. And then God meets him and blinds him. Um, and he kind of falls to the ground. And I think it's sort of an amazing story, um, not just because Jesus speaks to him and God does this powerful thing, but also because uh, uh, Saul has to learn something that he's not able to actually get around on his own. He needs to depend on God. And I think that picture of being blind 
when we're blind, well, especially if we're not used to, used to not being able to see, it can be really hard to get around. And I think that for each of you boys and girls, um, just a reminder that uh, we, we lean on the Lord's guidance in our lives to make our way around. Sometimes we think we can kind of do it with our eyes wide open and see where we need to go, but I think we're gonna, you're going to continue to learn how much you need to rely on him. So let's uh, ask a blessing on you and um, as you head down for Sunday school, okay? We'll pray and then we'll do the blessing. Lord, thank you for these boys and girls. Thank you for um, the way that you lead us and guide us. We acknowledge that um, there are lots of times where we try to kind of do it in our own power and in our own strength and end up going the wrong way. Uh, Lord, help us to be reminded of our need to, um, to hold on to your hand as you direct our paths and our ways. Bless these boys and girls in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, let's say the words of blessing, shall we? All right, have a safe trip down the stairs, okay? Yeah. Keep your eyes open. Yeah. Okay. Oh, boy. <laughs> it's my favorite part of the service. It's like a... For me as a pastor, it's like a sort of mini break. Everybody slowly makes their way down the stairs. And, but isn't it a beautiful sound, all those children full of energy and life? Well, this time, we're going to turn to God in a time of prayer. Let's bow our heads before him. We praise you, God, our creator, for your handiwork and shaping and sustaining your wondrous creation. We thank you for the miracle of life and for the wonder of living, for the blessings of this day, for this spring season and the warm temperatures that we've enjoyed this past week that refresh and renew us. We thank you for rain that has fallen for many of us last night. We experience your goodness, grace, and presence to the world that you've made and continue to sustain we thank you for the gift of gathering in your presence, of sharing a life together as a congregation, and for your word and spirit through which you continue to reveal yourself to us. We give thanks for the resources of the earth, for the plants that are coming up in our gardens, for precious minerals and gems that are buried deep in the ground, for wind and sunshine that remind us of your presence, but can also be harnessed to provide energy. We give thanks for the work and the skills that you provided us, us with, for those who work with their hands to bring shape to the raw materials of your creation, for those employed in business to provide products and services, for those who serve in grocery stores and restaurants, hospitals and schools, in the armed forces and on the front lines of providing safety in our community. We pray for those who work in agriculture uh, within this church community but, and also beyond that you would bless the work of their hands as they plant crops, care for animals, and provide goods for us to consume. And most of all, we give thanks for the gift of life, for the treasure that is stored in each person who is made in your image, and for all of the loved ones that you have placed in our lives. We pray for others, God our Savior, claiming your love in Jesus Christ for the whole world and committing ourselves to care for those around us in his name. And we remember those displaced by violence, for victims of war and oppression, for those who lack adequate food, shelter, and clothing in our community and beyond. Open our hearts to respond with care and provisions. Pray, we pray today for those who are struggling financially, especially because of the rising cost of living and of fuel, that you would not only calm hearts, but show yourself faithful in granting us our daily needs and reassuring us as we look to the future. We pray for specific needs in our world and within this nation. We remember communities in southern Manitoba that are affected by severe flooding, especially those living on the, the Pegasus First Nation, that they would experience your presence. We pray for entire communities in the Northwest Territories who have been evacuated from their homes due to flooding, that you would provide safety but also comfort for those who have lost so much. We pray for our church family. We give thanks for those who have recently celebrated birthdays and for your faithfulness to them through the years. 
We give thanks for the boys and girls of this congregation and the joy and enthusiasm they bring to life. We give thanks for Sunday school teachers and GEMS leaders who provide care and nurture in these young lives. We pray for those who need your healing touch. We again pray for Pam Pott as she continues to receive care in the hospital and as she waits for a surgery date that you would encourage her and provide healing in her life. O oh God, our Creator, this is the day that you've made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it and make Christ, the Son of Righteousness, shine forever in our hearts and draw us to the light of your radiant presence and glory. And we ask this in the name of Jesus, our Redeemer. Amen. Before we listen to God's word, let's stand together again as we sing a Holy Spirit living breath of God. Good morning. Before I want to, uh, before I'm going to read, I uh, want to you. I want to talk to you about a story. And by this time, for a year now, we have been doing this. And uh, for Henny and me, it was a great enjoyment to do that every day. Now I can see too for maybe younger families that uh, at supper time or so, when you're all sitting by the table, that uh, you're always crushed for time, I think, because kids have to go here and there. So maybe in the future or so when we do such a thing again, let's say for us, all the people, we have time, right? That's supper time, uh, let's say we, it's, it's a lot easier. But I think in the future, maybe uh, 
everybody is always busy with, with, uh, with, with time, with kids going everywhere. And let's say from past experience in our own high household, it was always busy. So I don't think we, 20 years ago, would have taken this much time to read the Bible. So in the future, when we do such a thing again, maybe as a family, maybe you can sit together and say, now maybe on Saturday night or so, on a Sunday morning or so, we take time to read this. Anyway, that's all that I have to say. And I'm going to read from uh, Acts 13, the verses 4 to 12. And it says here, the two of them, sent on their way by the Holy Spirit, went down to Seleucia and sailed from there to Cyprus. When they arrived at Salamis, they proclaimed the word of God in the Jewish synagogues. John was with them as their helper. They traveled through the whole island until they came to Paphos. There they met a Jewish sorcerer and false prophet named Bar-Jesus, who was an attendant of the proconsul, Sergius Paulus. The proconsul, an intelligent man, sent for Barnabas and Saul because he wanted to hear the word of God. But Elimas, the sorcerer, for that is what his name meant, opposed them and tried to turn the proconsul from their face. Then Saul, who was also called Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit, looked straight at Elimas and said, You are a child of the devil and an enemy of everything that is right. You are full of all kinds of deceit and trickery. Will you never stop perverting the right ways of the Lord? Now the hand of the Lord is against you. You are going to be blind for a time, not even able to see the light of the sun. Immediately, mist and darkness came over him, and he groped about, seeking someone to lead him by the hand. When the proconsul saw what had happened, he believed, for he was amazed at the teaching about the Lord. So far the reading. brothers and sisters in Christ. In the film version of J.R.R. Tolkien's The Two Towers, there's a scene where the great wizard Gandalf arrives with his companions at the Golden Hall of Theoden, a king of Rohan. And they've come to seek the king's military help against the gathering forces of evil. But as they enter the hall to appear before the king, they're met with a troubling sight. The king, once vibrant and once strong and, and vibrant, has grown old and tired. His hair and beard are unkempt. His face is wrinkled. His skin is pallid. His once bright, bright eyes are clouded with a troubled expression. He speaks only in a mumbled whisper. And the reason for King Theoden's deathly pallor is soon made clear. Grima, the king's chief advisor, has been in the service of dark forces. That for years he has been poisoning the king's mind well, Gandalf seizes the moment to confront Grima. But first, he rebukes him, and he says, Be silent, keep your forked tongue behind your teeth. And second, equipped with only his staff, Gandalf breaks the power of the spell over the king. And suddenly, Theoden is restored to his former self. His eyes grow clear. His skin regains a youthful complexion. He returns to his right mind. For the first time in a long time, he asks that the ancient royal sword of his people be brought to him. And with the weapon firmly in hand, he summons his army to prepare for the battle against the forces of the Dark Lord, Sauron. Well, today's scripture reading from Acts 13 reads much like a Tolkien novel. There's danger and excitement, adventure and hardship. And all of this culminates in an epic showdown between the kingdom of heaven and the forces of hell. Then in Acts 13, we look on as Paul takes to the mission field for the first time. Sinister spiritual forces conspire to derail his ministry. And in response, Paul relies on the power of the Holy Spirit and the transforming work of the gospel message 
and neither one disappoints as God confirms through words and through actions the ministry of Paul as an apostle of Jesus to the distant places of the empire. We're first introduced to Paul in Acts chapter 8. Before he is called by his Roman name, he's referred to by his Jewish name, Saul. And Saul first appears when Stephen, a leader in the early church, is martyred for his faith. It happens because Stephen directs a, a fiery speech at the Jewish religious leaders of Jerusalem. But his words fail to win the crowd over, and instead they respond with a collective fury. They pick up rocks, they hurl them violently at Stephen until he lays motionless on the ground, dead. But meanwhile, looking on and giving his approval is Saul, a devout and a zealous Jew, that Saul makes it his mission in life to destroy the church, one believer at a time. So who exactly is Saul, this man intent on crushing the Christian faith? Well, Saul is born a Roman citizen to Jewish parents in Tarsus, a city on the southern coast of modern-day Turkey. When he's old enough, he moves to Jerusalem to study Torah, probably when he is a teenager. He learns the law of Moses under the tutelage of Gamaliel, a highly respected religious leader, and by the time that Saul reaches his mid-twenties, he is fully trained as a Pharisee. A Pharisee was a, a Jew set apart by strict observance to the law. Pharisees are featured prominently in the Gospels of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, that these religious leaders are regularly seen interacting with Jesus. They discuss theology with him. They question Jesus on what it means to keep the law. And though there's a few that share a secret admiration for Jesus, most of them reject him. And they conspire to arrest Jesus, to put him on trial, and to sentence him to death. And so it is for Saul. His rejection of Jesus causes him to fiercely attack and intimidate the believers. It may have taken up to 10 years for Saul to be trained as a full-fledged Pharisee. It only takes one encounter with Jesus for him to be transformed by his grace. The story of Saul's conversion happens soon after he goes on his brutal rampage. After hearing that followers of Jesus have moved to the city of Damascus, Saul makes his way there to track them down and to arrest them. But along the way, the risen and ascended Jesus appears to him on the road. Saul is blinded by a bright light. He falls to the ground. A voice speaks to him. It's the voice of Jesus. Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? And Saul is led by the hand into Damascus. There he gives his life to Jesus. He receives the gift of the Holy Spirit and is baptized. Jesus takes this enemy of the gospel and he changes him into an ambassador of the good news. By the time we get to our reading from Acts 13, time has passed. Saul has left Damascus and Jerusalem behind. And as he grows in following Jesus, God prepares him for the work that lies ahead. Paul spends time in Arabia, he also spends time in his hometown of Tarsus. And eventually, God's call leads him to the city of Antioch, one of the key hubs for the growing church. And though we remember Jerusalem as the place where believers first gather together, it is Antioch where followers of Jesus are first called Christians. The city of Antioch has been dubbed the cradle of Christianity, and it's in Antioch that we witness the Holy Spirit doing a new thing, Jewish and Gentile believers, they gather together in unity. Barriers are taken down that formerly kept them from sharing together a life in Christ. Well, Paul arrives in Antioch at the invitation of Barnabas, a, a Jewish follower of Jesus. And Paul and Barnabas share this special connection. And that after Paul's conversion, Barnabas is one of the few Christians to accept that Paul has had a genuine change of heart. 
And it's also Barnabas who goes to the leaders in Jerusalem of the church to encourage them to receive Paul as one of their own. But when persecution causes the church to scatter beyond Jerusalem, Barnabas takes the gospel message up to the city of Antioch. And over time, and with the help of the Holy Spirit, Barnabas establishes a Christian community there. God blesses the work. He causes it to grow. And with growth comes a pressing need for solid preaching and thorough discipleship. And so Barnabas reaches out to his friend Paul, who's serving the Lord over in Tarsus. And soon both men are together in Antioch, doing the Lord's work side by side. And it's there, as Paul and Barnabas are serving the church, that something exciting and unexpected happens. That during a time of prayer and fasting, the church community senses the Holy Spirit providing clear instructions. Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. And just like that, the two men are gathering supplies. They're preparing for the journey ahead. With the blessing of the church, they head out. Where will they go? What, What dangers and joys will they face along the way? Well, traveling in the ancient world by land or by sea was full of peril. Ships frequently sank in stormy weather. Lonely stretches of road provided excellent hiding places for bandits to attack. And yet Paul and Barnabas leave with the certainty that God is going ahead of them. And I find that this in itself provides a lesson of faith for us today. That there are times when God calls us to take big leaps of faith, as we see Paul and Barnabas doing in our reading. We're invited to be open to these big leaps. And much of the time, the Spirit nudges us in small ways to take small yet courageous steps of trust in Jesus. Well, how might you open yourself more fully to the prompting of the Holy Spirit in your life? Well, on the one hand, the departure of Paul and Barnabas for distant lands provides a picture of trust in God's leading It says that the two of them were sent on their way by the Holy Spirit, that led by the Spirit, Paul and Barnabas take the road that leads from Antioch to the Mediterranean coast and to the port city of Seleucia. They board a ship, destination destination Cyprus. They model reliance on the Spirit. And all of these details are included to encourage and challenge us as we seek God's calling in our lives. But on the other hand, Paul and Barnabas approach this first missionary journey with a plan. They may not have been sure about the destination, but they know exactly what they're supposed to do when they arrive. Their ship lands at Salamis on the east coast of Cyprus. The first thing that Paul and Barnabas do is they make their way to the nearest synagogue. And this becomes Paul's pattern throughout his entire first missionary journey. That Paul, who once used his religious training to discredit followers of Jesus, now uses it to prove the truth of the gospel message. That Paul is able to speak in the synagogues because he has these excellent credentials as a Pharisee. He had been trained by one of Israel's best teachers, and people would have listened to his message with openness and respect. Well, Cyprus had a large Jewish population in the first century. And so picture Paul and Barnabas traveling the length of the the island. And they stop at every synagogue, synagogue along the way, great and small. And they tell the story of Jesus. And eventually this leads them all the way to Paphos, the capital city of Cyprus. And it's here that we reach a critical moment in the story because they are granted an audience with Sergius Paulus, the most powerful government official on the island. In the first century, Cyprus was a Roman province. It was governed by a proconsul who was accountable to the Roman Senate. 
The position of proconsul was similar in standing to the role occupied in Jerusalem by Pontius Pilate. And as Paul and Barnabas arrive at the outskirts of Paphos, news of their presence on the island makes its way all the way up to Sergius Paulus. The proconsul invites Paul and Barnabas to appear before him. A religion was a powerful force in the first century. Government officials were hesitant to allow new religions to take root. Most of the residents of Paphos worshipped Aphrodite, the goddess of love and fertility. In fact, every year a large festival drew people from all over the island into the city. Jews on Cyprus were protected under Roman law so they could practice their beliefs without fear of persecution. But when Sergius Paulus hears the news that two Jews have come to his island to speak about a faith that doesn't fit neatly into any kind of category, he calls them into his presence. But he will be the judge of whether Paul and Barnabas are given the right to continue sharing their faith. And as the two missionaries get ready to speak, we sense again the leading of the Holy Spirit in bringing them before the most prominent person on all of the island of Cyprus. And it's here that the story builds up to its climax. Not only do Paul and Barnabas meet Sergius Paulus, they also become acquainted with the proconsul's personal attendant, a a Jewish sorcerer and a false prophet named Bar-Jesus. Well, the name Bar-Jesus literally means son of Jesus, but he is nothing like the Savior. He is a sorcerer, someone who practices magic or fortune-telling. This in itself gives away the nature of his character. Sorcery was officially banned from Judaism. That Whatever magic that Bar-Jesus practices is not used to advance the cause of the Jewish faith. It is to earn him favor in the eyes of his master. As Paul and Barnabas are sharing the truth about Jesus, Bar-Jesus is making a last-ditch effort to keep Sergius Paulus from accepting the Christian faith. That if the proconsul puts his trust in the true Messiah, Bar-Jesus is going to be out of a job. And it's at this moment that Paul again responds to the prompting of the Holy Spirit. And it says that Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit, looks straight at him and said, you are a child of the devil and an enemy of everything that is right. But you are full of all kinds of deceit and trickery. Will you never stop perverting the ways of the Lord? We'll talk about a bold confrontation. But that's not all. The Lord afflicts Bar-Jesus with temporary blindness, that the one who sought to mislead now himself needs to be led by the hand. This dramatic scene also reminds us that there is opposition to the gospel, that there are satanic forces that make every effort to keep the message of Jesus from taking hold. Some will respond with hostility, or they will seek to undermine what God is doing. And yet we also see the power of God's word and spirit in overcoming. Well, are there any examples from your own life where you have experienced this kind of opposition? And if so, how did God prove himself faithful in continuing to proclaim the gospel by the power of the Spirit. Well, this intense confrontation is quickly followed by the response of Sergius Paulus, who has been watching the scene unfold. The proconsul is described as an intelligent man. His gifts as a leader earn him a position of authority over the population of the island. And when Sergius Paulus sees the way that Paul rebukes Bar-Jesus, and listens to his presentation of the gospel, it changes his life. It says that when the proconsul saw what had happened, he believed. 
for he was amazed at the teaching of the Lord. It's a huge moment in Paul's ministry that when faced with adversity, it confirms his calling. Paul, who once rejected the gospel, now becomes its most passionate advocate. But there's also another reason that this conversion story has special meaning. It is the first time that for Paul, that a Gentile, an outsider to the Jewish faith, accepts the gospel. This might also help to explain why this story from Acts 13 is the last time that we hear Paul being referred to as Saul. That Paul switches exclusively to his Roman name because he understands that his primary mission is to the Gentiles, to those who know little or nothing of God's promises to redeem the world through a Messiah that we know as Jesus. Well, Paul sets the bar high when it comes to living out his Christian faith with passion and commitment and determination. And yet the purpose of today's Bible story isn't intended to leave us feeling inadequate. It's meant to encourage us as we respond to God's call on our lives, whether that call is to distant places or to serve here in this community. Well, two key themes emerge from the story that are meant to help us and to direct us in our faith. The first is that Paul and Barnabas rely on the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit calls them to embark on the journey. The Holy Spirit directs them along the way. The Holy Spirit provides courage at just the right moment to say just the right words. Well, in our Reformed tradition, we tend to minimize the role of the Spirit in our everyday lives as Christians, and yet I wonder if we are missing out on the fullness of this gift that God has granted to us. And so let's continue to open ourselves up to his leading and his prompting in our lives. Well, second, Paul and Barnabas respond to God's call with a clear sense of their purpose. It is to proclaim God's word. And they never waver from this course, whether they're speaking in the synagogues or, or standing in the presence of a powerful man like Sergius Paulus. Well, God's word can be spoken through our lives in many ways. Through the actual words that come out of our mouths, but also through the ways that we live. That God's word is like a seed planted in a garden that he waters and causes to grow. And our job is to plant seeds. And we see in Acts 13 that the proclamation of the word and the power of the Holy Spirit together lead to the transformation of hearts and lives. On this small corner of the world that we are called to continue the work began many years ago that has now spread to the ends of the earth. Well, this story of Paul and Barnabas making their way to Cyprus is the first of many stories yet to be told in the book of Acts. For the next 10 years, Paul continues to journey around the world of his day. He travels extensively. He plants churches in predominantly Gentile populated cities. Later, he comes back to provide support. He also writes letters to build up and to challenge the church. Thirteen of these letters are included in the New Testament. He models a courageous witness in the face of adversity. He mentors a young pastor named Timothy. Some scholars believe that he makes it as far away as Spain. Scripture confirms that he ends up in Rome as he spends time in prison waiting to go on trial before Caesar, and that eventually he is martyred for his faith. 
And as we look back, we give thanks for the legacy of Paul's mission to share the good news. We as believers today are a part of that legacy. But may his word continue to go out. May his spirit continue to fill and equip us. And may God's name be glorified as the message of Jesus is proclaimed in all the earth. Let's pray. We thank you, Lord, for the gift of your word and the gift of your spirit. Lord, sometimes we minimize the power of of each of these things in our lives. And yet, Lord, we know that you call us to continue to grow in both receiving your spirit and uh, to learn and to deepen our understanding of your word. We also know that by your spirit that you speak through us to others about the good news of Jesus. Well, Lord, we are encouraged by the story of Paul and Barnabas, the way that they seem to give up everything, to risk everything, to follow what they are certain is your lead for them. And Lord, we pray that in the same way you would fill us with courage. Well, Lord, for some of us, that courage may take place uh, in our workplaces, in the schools that we're a part of, in our neighborhoods that we belong to. Uh, For others of us, maybe there is a a sense of of some sort of a a deeper and a bigger call to something that we feel anxious about taking steps toward, but which we sense you continuing to um, encourage us to do. Well, Lord, wherever you have placed us, help us to be those who continue to plant the seeds of the gospel message and help us to rely more fully on the work of your Holy Spirit in us and through us. And so we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, there is no God as great as you Oh God, we're going to sing uh, together that song, uh, standing as we sing. blessed and encouraged by God's word, prompted and filled with the Holy Spirit, we go from this place with these words of blessing. Will the peace of God which passes all understanding keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and the love of God and of our Savior Jesus Christ and the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be and remain with you always. Thank you.